As you all know, or uh, most of you know, and David already mentioned, in 1991, at the University of Kiel, there was a conference entitled Towards a New Theory of Organizations to celebrate 20 years of David's book. The results have been published in 1994 in a book edited by John Hazard and Martin Parker. I attended the conference together with Bernard Jorges, and for some reason, we were slightly late to the opening presentation, which was to be held by David. When we quietly got in, I whispered to Bernard, thank God we are not late. There is some young guy opening the whole thing. Silverman is not here yet. I simply couldn't believe that this young guy could be the author of such a work, obviously already a classic. At the time, I didn't even know that it was based on his doctoral dissertation either. Nevertheless, in the introductory chapter to the book Towards the new, a New Theory of Organization that summarized the conference, David spent quite a lot of time emphasizing how old he was, as he did today. As I see it now, David's book signaled the beginning of a methodological revolution that reached its peak in the 1990s. In 1991, he repeated that the social world is neither simply objective nor subjective, but consists of a set of practices that researchers need to describe. And he was pleading for a practice perspective, which Stuart Clegg also took up in his contribution to the conference. David also said then, that there are no principled grounds to be either qualitative or quantitative in approach. After all, as he asserted already in 1971, the action approach can most usefully be seen as method of analysis rather than, the, than theory. Now, alas, we are back to what he called the practice of abstracted empiricism and quoted it today too. I know history goes in cycles and there will be a new revolution, even if I most likely won't see it. But among many things I do not understand about the present decline, one is its origins. Where did it come from? In the theory of organization, David brilliantly presented the most important directions in organization studies of the time, explaining their intellectual origins. At present, I recognize some directions, mostly those I am interested in, but I see lots of publications that I cannot locate anywhere, that assuming I have been able to read them as quite many are literally unreadable. I was wondering about that already when Yin has written his nonsense about case studies, which became immensely popular and which went against all that historians who always use this method say about it. Nowadays, some commentators speak of neo-positivism, but I see rather something, a kind of positivism light. The original positivists knew what they did and why they did it so. One can disagree with them, but still they argued for their stance. Excuse me. Many young researchers, as David pointed out in his commentary on taking theory too far, when asked what they, why they do what they do, they answer, this is how it is done. The force of argument seems to depend on the number of names they're quoting. And as David pointed out in, the, in this taking theory too far, recently the terms theory and theoretical seem to be very much of fashion in organization studies, both in texts already published and in the comments by reviewers. Alas, reading these texts leaves reader, or at least this reader, wondering what exactly is meant by those terms. Allegedly, it was Pythagoras who coined the term theory, theoria, 
to connote a group of people who came towards the Olympic Games. This in turn being a metaphor for human life. Still, it was Plato who introduced the notion in the context of explaining the desirable knowledge and the duties of a philosopher king in the Republic. Even then, the notion and the Plato's attitude towards it was far from clear cut and has been a, a topic of a heated debate between philosophers and classicists. This ancient ambiguity has been evoked many a time by various social scientists trying to establish what a theory is and what is not. Thus, Howard Becker in his Through Values to Social Interpretation asked dramatically after ascertaining, of course, that nothing is more practical than theory, does not its etymology show that the theorist was one who traveled to see men and things. This question and its implied plea were characteristic moves for interpretative scholars such as ourselves then and now. Davies has written in 1971 that a theory is a statement in general terms about the likely relationship between two or more phenomena. As a narratologist, I see theory as a plot, which is practically the same thing. A phenomenon under study is being related to what preceded it, what follows it, and to other phenomena observable at the same time. As to the purpose of formulating such relationships, I like Bloomer's explanation, which says that a social theory seeks to develop a meaningful interpretation of the social world or some significant part of it. Its aim is not to form scientific propositions, but to outline and define life situation so that people may have a clearer understanding of their world, its possibilities of development and the directions along which it may move. It is certainly not a pile of abstract terms, most of them of Greek of and Latin origin, of whose etymology the writers seem blissfully unaware. Obviously, the intellectual operations of comparison, but also of reduction and abstraction, are unavoidable in theory construction. But reduction and abstraction can go wrong or succeed. When they go wrong, the abstraction and reduction will kill the most interesting aspects of the phenomena under theorizing, making it sterile. The result is akin to translation into a dead language, a text that no longer means anything to anybody. A skillful reduction and a sex successful abstraction open the analysis to further comparisons and generalizations. And together with the literary theorists, I believe that generalization is always the privilege of the reader, not of the author. Such a theory transfers research results into the reader's sphere of experience, primarily through a dexterous use of metaphors and similes. As a result, it may mean something to almost everybody. 50 years later, I'm still faithful to the action frame of reference, which I apply in a spirit recommended by John Law in 1991, when he suggested that organization should be treated as a verb or more exactly as a state resulting from organizing. Thus, I am mostly interested in theories of organizing to which my concept of action nets belong. But I would like to suggest two additions to that frame, and I'm curious whether David will agree with me or not. Actually, it is rather an issue of improving the status of two terms that recently acquired a bad name. One is description. 
As a reader, I am interested in descriptions. I want to learn about things, people, and phenomena that I do not know anything about, rather than listening to yet another declension of the same old nouns, sometimes with an addition of a new adjective. Also, as pointed out by literary theorists, descriptions are always interpretative. Only some interpretations are more convincing than others and may deserve the name of theory. The other term is even more tricky. I propose functionality to avoid mixing it with, up with structure and functionalism. Actually, it's, it's all fault of you British guys because you didn't want to say the, the whole name structure and functionalism. So you started saying functionalism and it's not good at all. Because after all, as far as I know, organizing is an action whose purpose is to get something to work. I may be biased due to my upbringing uh, two of my brothers were engineers. And of course, as David pointed out already in 1971, while criticizing the Mertonian functionalism, the claim that something functions inevitably leads to a question, functions for whom? Yet for me, this is an absolutely relevant research question, or rather a set of research questions. Does it work? If so, for whom? If not, why? Or rather, how come? As to the main questions asked by David, why this has happened and how it can be put right, I'm a pessimist, as it can be expected from a Central European. Alas, the latest developments at the University of Leicester make me think that not only Central Europeans have now reasons to be pessimistic. Well, I started with an anecdote, so I will end one with, with one too. Recently, I needed to check something in my publications from the early 1970s. They were all about factors, variables, motivation, decision-making and such. I'm sure I could easily publish them now. Thus, I'm afraid that even social sciences go in circles and I would expect the next methodological revolution to take place around 2045. And then, much as I am now quoting Pythagoras and Plato, everybody will be quoting Silverman 1971. Thank you.